building a wall would actually increase the number of illegal immigrants in America. What? How could it possibly? Here, I'll show you. Just building the wall would be practically impossible. This is where it would be. Oh no, el perrito. It would have to stretch over 2,000 miles of rough terrain. Cutting through mountains, rivers, villages, and even people's homes. Disculpe, ¿puedo usar su baño? Ay, lo siento. Está en México. And all that destruction is monstrously expensive. Just building the wall would cost between 15 and 25 billion dollars. <gasps> Ay, el duende tiene magia de Monica. It would easily be one of the single most expensive pieces of infrastructure in American history, costing as much as 20 Hoover Dams or NASA's entire annual budget. That's one small step for man. One giant wall for no reason. Not to mention the astronomical cost of staffing and maintaining the wall, which taxpayers like you and your children will be stuck paying forever. I paid for the wall. My father's father paid for the wall. And one day you will pay for the wall. Because this is Wall World. Even just faking the wall for our show was prohibitively expensive. Oh, looks like our CGI budget ran out. Oh. OK, yes, it may be expensive, but that doesn't change the fact that once we build it, it will work. Not like you think. Increasing security at the border will never stop illegal immigration. Why not? No one's getting past me. Yes, they are, because it's estimated that between 27 and 40% of all undocumented immigrants in America came here on planes. I forgot about planes. These immigrants didn't sneak over the border. They came here legally through passport control, then just overstayed their visas. And guess what? A border wall's not going to stop them because, reminder, planes can fly over walls. You fools. You forgot about planes. We always forget about planes. Even by your estimate of visa overstays, the wall would still stop about half of America's 11 million illegal immigrants. No, it wouldn't, because of a little something called circular flow. Here, I'll show you. For decades, immigration to the US was a circular flow. People would come, work for a bit, and then after they were done, go home to their families. Meet Douglas Massey. Thanks, Adam. My arms are getting pretty tired waiting for my cue. He's a professor at Princeton and a pioneering researcher on this topic. When the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations drastically increased border enforcement in response to public opinion, they stopped that circular flow. Not by keeping people out, but by keeping people in. As it got harder and harder to go back and forth, people crossing the border decided they were much better off just staying in the US. Ah, se me olvidaron las llaves in Mexico. If I go back to Mexico now, he won't let me back in the US. I guess I'll just stay here, in Tucson. Ironically, this increase in border enforcement caused the number of undocumented immigrants living in the United States to skyrocket by 248%. It's counterintuitive, but building a wall wouldn't stop people from coming in. It would actually stop them from going back. In fact, the whole idea of building a border wall is misguided. The Mexican economy is doing quite well right now and population growth has slowed way down. So there's not much pressure to immigrate. The number of illegal border crossings is actually at an all-time low. If you're a professor, then why are you in the desert? I'm not. I'm a mirage. <gasps> Ay, el duende tiene un amigo fantasma. <laughs> Some time ago, humanity discovered vast deposits of fuel buried deep within the Earth. We learned to extract it, burn it for energy, and release it into the air. And about 150 years ago, we rebuilt our entire civilization around that energy source. We burn it to travel. We burn it to eat. We burn it to live. Fossil fuels brought about one of the greatest increases in standard of living in human history. We could never go back. But by burning this incredible fuel source, we are also inexorably heating the Earth. 2015 was the hottest year since we started keeping records in 1880. And thanks to rising ocean temperatures, average sea levels have already risen about eight inches. 
and we're in for a lot worse. This is Dale Jameson. He's a professor of environmental studies at NYU. Wayne, we've already done so much damage to the atmosphere that we'll be lucky if we can hold the warming to two degrees Celsius. Two degrees? Well, that's just the difference between a jacket and a slightly lighter jacket. Not to the Earth, it isn't. Just two degrees of warming could cause huge droughts, massive wildfires, the loss of many species, the collapse of our agricultural productivity, and the rising sea levels could make our coastal cities uninhabitable. And remember, two degrees of warming is the best we can realistically hope for. The question isn't, will warming happen? The question is, how bad will it be? That's terrible. Isn't there something I can do? The sad truth is that we've already put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we're more than halfway towards that two degree centigrade limit. And right now, companies and countries already own enough fossil fuel in reserves to meet that limit five times over. Five times over? To keep it in the ground, they'd have to give up trillions of dollars, and we'd have to change our entire way of life. And what happens if we burn it? What happens to our planet then? I don't know, but it won't be our planet anymore. Of course I want as much medical care as possible. What could be the downside? Oh, there are a ton. For starters, how about the fact that this place rips off folks like you every day? <sighs> Whatever. I know the hospital is expensive, but it is worth it if I get the best treatment. No, it isn't. American healthcare is not the best in the world, but despite that, we spend more per person annually on healthcare than any other developed nation. And a big part of the reason for that is that American hospitals overcharge patients massively. This neck brace is worth $20, but the hospital charged him $154. This IV bag costs less than a buck, but she was charged $137. These are real prices, folks. Hold up. Wildly inflated healthcare costs? This sounds like the work of politicians to me. Was it Obamacare, Trump aid, McConnell meds? What did you do? I'm not a politician. I'm just a boring white guy. Why does this keep happening? Sorry, Rachel, but this time it's not the politician's fault. The problem starts with something called the Charge Master. The Charge Master is a secret document full of insane prices that hospitals use to charge us whatever they want. Let's go on a trip through the history of medical billing. Wow, I'd rather not. A hundred years ago, hospital pricing was pretty simple. We take the cost of providing care and add a little on top to make a profit. One amputation costs us five bucks, so we'll charge you six fifty. But after the rise of insurance companies, hospital billing got complicated, in part because these gigantic corporations demanded gigantic discounts. We send you thousands of patients every day, so we want Half off all your prices. We can't afford that. So to please these powerful insurance companies, hospitals cooked up a plan. I've got it. We'll make up a really high fake price and then give you a discount off that. Hey, as long as I get to tell my boss we got it cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> And in less than a century, healthcare prices went from reasonable to nonsensical. Let's make one Tylenol $37. Three stitches, $2,200. Ooh, here's a pitch. What if we made rectal exams 69? Nah, that's too silly even for me. These crazily inflated prices are kept in the hospital's charge master. It's actually a computer file, but the book is more dramatic. Seven dollars for a single alcohol swab? That's ridiculous. And true. Well, I only pay my premium. If they want to rip off my insurance company with their fake prices, what do I care? If you ever lose insurance, you'll care. Because here's the really evil part. If you don't have insurance, you actually get charged these fake prices. Let's see, heart x-rays. That'll be $33,000. I can't afford that. No problem, we'll just garnish your wages. Oh, bugs. Wait, they actually charge people without insurance fake prices? Yeah. This is terrible. 
Well, thankfully, I have insurance, so the charge master doesn't affect me. Unfortunately, it does. Even if you're insured, you can get billed charge master prices if you go out of network. And anything can be out of network. The hospital you go to, the equipment used to treat you, even the doctors you see. Aero specialist, out of network, I'm very expensive. Hospitals make a ton of money overcharging out of network patients. It's a real cash cow, and we all get milked. Worse, every hospital has its own charge master. A treatment that costs 7,000 at one hospital could cost 100 grand down the road. And you can't comparison shop when you're dying. <laughs> Which hospital are you on, Moneybags Medical or St. Vincent's Discount Sick House? <laughs> Moneybags it is. Plus, since your insurance company faces inflated costs, that can trickle down to you in the form of higher premiums. Oh, surprisingly painless. Wait till you get the bill. Mm -hmm. Listen, Drew Carey, all you adults always tell us the same thing. Weed's gonna kill us, it's a gateway drug. Vine isn't funny. Oh, no, for most people, weed is essentially harmless. Oh, okay, no way, Jose. Look, I know this stuff is a little overboard, but you can't tell kids weed isn't bad. Of course I can, it's true. And we've known it for decades. Counting deaths from the substance alone, alcohol kills 88,000 people a year. Tobacco kills 480,000. And marijuana kills absolutely no one. Uh, according to curriculum, marijuana can get you hooked on harder substances. It's a gateway drug. Yeah, educators have been saying that for years, but it's not true. Most people who try marijuana don't even continue smoking marijuana. <laughs> This dude knows what's up. Now, that doesn't mean that it's perfectly safe. Dude, I thought you were cool. Oh, I wish. If you're under 25, smoking weed can lead to memory problems and poor cognitive functioning. But if you're an adult and your brain is finished developing, it's really your choice. Adam, wrong way, also not in a school. Sorry, I usually only smoke at parties, and I'm rarely invited to them. I wonder why. The truth is, if you know the risks and you use it in moderation, weed is no big deal. And in fact, humans have been using it for millennia. Humans started growing cannabis as a crop over 8,000 years ago. This crop will feed our family for a year. And this crop will make movies way funnier. In 440 BCE, Herodotus wrote about the ancient tradition of cannabis steam baths. Fellow citizens, as a wise man once told me, vape life. <laughs> and in America, for many years, marijuana was available in over-the-counter medications. Step right up and try Professor Holcorium's rejuvenating tincture. Now with the Arab hashish. For most of America's history, weed was legal. No one cared about it. Wait, so what changed? I mean, there must be some reason we banned it. Oh, there is, and it's real weird. Enter Harry Anslinger, commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and a staunch prohibitionist. Yeah. Our funding has been cut. They'll shut me down if I don't find a new chemical to demonize. Let's see, what are people scared of for no good reason? Aha, Mexicans. And Mexicans smoke marijuana. That's it. Hey, racist mob, marijuana makes Mexicans thirst for white blood. Spread the word. Anslinger used that racism to fuel a propaganda campaign against the drug, testifying before Congress. Marijuana is an addictive drug which produces in its users insanity, criminality, and death. Soon, the marijuana causes violence meme was everywhere, from newspapers to movies. Just a young boy. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. To subtle political cartoons. Nazi propaganda. What does that even mean? Why would he just say the words Nazi propaganda? Honestly, no idea. But it worked. In 1937, Congress banned marijuana. And later, with Anslinger's help, they passed the first mandatory minimum sentencing laws, which made it so that your first time getting caught with this could put you away from two to 10 years. Thank you, that's what I thought. And the true irony is, the government knew Anslinger's claims were false. Scientists proved marijuana wasn't connected to violence or insanity in the 40s. And in 1973, a bipartisan commission recommended Nixon decriminalize it. But Nixon being Nixon... Mr. President, literally everyone agrees. Marijuana is safe. Out! Get out! I have zero chill! The war on drugs begins now! 
I don't understand. If he knew it was safe, why would he be so tough on it? Well, why don't you ask Nixon's aide, John Ehrlichman? He said in 1994, we knew he couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That's a real quote. Yeah, that's a real quote. Nixon started the war on drugs to bully his political enemies and minorities. His own aide admitted it. I can't believe I've been teaching this to children. Solitary confinement has devastating effects on prisoners' mental health. In solitary, you're kept alone for 23 hours a day in a room the size of a king-size bed. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. Me and Murph share a queen. Wait, where are those voices coming from? Oh, no. Oh, gosh. I'm seeing things. It's an archaic and cruel form of punishment that started in the 1800s. Eh, something to watch, I guess. Solitary confinement was conceived by Quakers, who thought prisoners would use the time to reflect and study the Bible. You know, I've been meaning to read this. But even they decided it was too cruel to use. The Supreme Court at the time declared, prisoners subject to solitary confinement became violently insane. Others committed suicide. Oof, we gotta stop doing this. Stop, stop! We did stop. Solitary confinement fell out of use in the U.S. for a century. But a few decades ago, we brought it back, and it's been destroying minds ever since. Destroying minds? I mean, that sounds a little hyperbolic. Yeah, maybe. What do I know? I'm just a hallucination. Hello? Adam? Is anyone here? Humans are social animals, and a prolonged lack of social contact can cause serious and permanent brain damage. People held in solitary hallucinate, fall into depression, and lose the ability to keep track of how much time has passed. How long have I been in here? Oh, I'm really losing it. Emily, you okay in there? Kendra, oh, thank God. Why am I even here? I thought solitary was for the worst of the worst. Nope. Solitary confinement is routinely used in our prison system. It's basically given to anyone the guards don't want to deal with. The mentally ill. LGBT. I wouldn't eat dinner. We had it coming. Man, if I'm gonna hallucinate a Tony Award winning musical, why couldn't it be Hamilton? Solitary confinement is given to between 80 to 100,000 people a year. They're actually entire prisons made up of nothing but solitary cells. They're called supermax prisons. Enormous complexes full of people held in tiny cages like animals, slowly being driven insane. Oh, that's okay. <gasps> Uh, wait, is that formula? No, tell me you're breastfeeding. Oh, um, well, I, I tried, but he kind of was having a hard time latching at the hospital, and the nurse says it was okay if I supplement, so... Um, formula is toxic. You have to breastfeed. Ugh, no way. I hate when people breastfeed in public. Do that at home. Nobody wants to see that. Um, excuse me? Adam, help me. Tell them which one is right. Oh, no. No way am I getting in the middle of this. I heard formula has autism in it. That's it. Hi, Miss Murphy. Hey, Patty. You, you're gonna tell a mom where and when she can feed her baby? Get a life. Breastfeeding is normal, natural, and great. Preach, sister. And you, how dare you judge how a mom feeds her kid? Formula isn't just healthy and safe, it's a literal lifesaver. Emily, let me show you. Okay. Knowledge from a primary source. Before formula, the only way to feed your baby was to breastfeed. And forget about getting anything else done, because breastfeeding takes 35 hours a week. What? That's like a full-time job. And the worst thing is, if you couldn't breastfeed, there weren't any other good options. My teeth's all tapped. Looks like it's bread soaked in water for you, little spud. This is a real thing people did. Babies grew up malnourished or died if their moms couldn't breastfeed. It's horrible. Then, in 1865, this friggin' Albert Einstein named Eustace von Liebig invented baby formula. Ma'am, your babe shall no longer dine on duck food. Instead, he will dine 
on science. Formula allowed women to leave the house or join the workforce, but most importantly, it saved babies' lives. Look out, Word, here we come! Formula isn't scary, it's a modern miracle. OK, but isn't formula just a bunch of chemicals? Well, yeah, Emily, it is, because literally everything is a bunch of chemicals. Breast milk is also chemicals. The question is whether those chemicals are nutritionally different. And the answer is no. Meet professor and lactation expert Courtney Young. Hi, Emily. Hi. Patty's right. Formula is a safe and nutritionally complete alternative to breast milk for things like IQ, asthma, allergies, eczema. Once you account for income and education, there's almost no difference between breastfeeding and formula feeding. The evidence that breastfeeding makes a difference is just inconclusive. Oh, yeah. I formula fed Murph, I breastfed his brother Durf, and they're both idiots. Ah, oh, Mom, Durf just threw a bocce ball at me. The fact is, formula feeding is a completely safe and nutritious alternative to breastfeeding. If you want or need to feed your baby formula, do it with confidence. Wow, thank you. Thanks, Professor Young. No, wait. What about places where they don't have access to clean water? Good question, Hairball. Mixing contaminated water with formula can be harmful, but if you use clean water and sterilized bottles, it's a completely safe and nutritious option. Oh. Not so fast. I read mommy blogs, like, for fun, and they say that breastfeeding actually makes your baby love you more because it releases a bonding chemical called oxytocin. Oh, oh, can I take this one? Go ahead. Oxytocin is a hormone that gets released when you do things like hug or cuddle. That's why the media loves to call it the love hormone. But that same hormone is also released when you do things like fire a gun or watch porn. According to a comprehensive review from 2008, there is no convincing support for a connection between breastfeeding and the quality of the mother-infant relationship. Hm. Breastfeeding is a great way to bond with your baby, but it's not the only one. And the fact is, not all women can do it. 15% of moms can't breastfeed, not to mention the parents who foster and adopt. So, the next time someone tries to guilt trip you or any other parent about how they feed their baby, you tell them they can eat my feet. Thanks, Patty. Today, we'll learn about Christopher Columbus, the heroic explorer who discovered America and proved the Earth was round. Actually, Columbus was an incompetent buffoon who never even set foot in America. <laughs> hush, hush. We all know Columbus wasn't perfect. That's an understatement. The real story of Columbus is even worse and weirder than you think. All aboard the Magic Band! <laughs> First of all, Columbus couldn't have discovered that the Earth was round because in his time, it was already common knowledge. A globe's for sale. A perfectly ordinary globe's for sale. Oh. What? <laughs> then why did it take until 1492 for anyone to sail the ocean blue? Simple. Back then, they didn't know the Americas existed, so navigators thought there was no way a ship could make it all the way from Europe to Asia. So Columbus set sail because he was brave. Nope, he set sail because he was a doofus who was terrible at math. Instead of trusting the experts, Columbus believed the Earth was thousands of miles smaller than it actually was. Fools, all of them. My math says the Earth is teeny tiny and shaped like a pear, and at the top, it has a succulent nipple. He actually believed that? Yes. I actually believe this. I can sail from Europe to India in a matter of days. That's extremely wrong. It took years for Columbus to convince the king and queen his plan didn't suck. But competition in the spice trade was getting intense. So Ferdinand and Isabella were desperate to find a new way to get their fix. The Earth is tiny and also a pair. Give me money, please. This money's an idiot. I don't care. Fine. Give this more on the bare minimum. 90 dumb men and three dumb ships. If you die, who cares? Right, and that's when Columbus showed them all and became a hero. But you know what happens to mouthy students? They get extra credit? I turn them into iguanas. Say hi, Edward. Kill me. Mm -hmm. Now, children, that's the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, the ships Columbus sailed to discover America. I'm really sorry, Ms. Dazzle, but Columbus never set foot in America. 
Of all the modern-day countries Columbus made it to, like Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, none of them were in the United States. Okay, fine. Then uh, Columbus discovered Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Sure he did, if you don't count the quarter million Taino people that live there already. Uh, occupied? Someone lives here? Right. I know this part. He thought he made it to India. Aha! This is India, and these people are Indians. I will be rich in spices and gold. <laughs> what a silly mistake. Yes, if by silly you mean brutal, and by a mistake you mean one of several. The Taino treated Columbus and his crew with the utmost hospitality. Hug? Ugh. We need reinforcements! Columbus repaid their kindness by returning with 17 ships and 1,200 men so he could enslave the Taino and steal their gold. There was only one problem. They didn't have any. You, gold, now! Oh, I want to help, but what is gold? This infuriated Columbus, and soon he and his crew began to slaughter them. This is very inappropriate for me to see. Columbus's regime was so senselessly brutal that by 1542, the Taino population on the island had fallen to 200. <sighs> I, I can't believe it. I had no clue that Columbus was this cruel. But after this, he must have gone on to do great things. Hmm? Nope, this was literally all he did. He didn't discover America, and he didn't prove the Earth was round. He just bounced around the Caribbean, slaughtered a bunch of innocent people, and died thinking he had made it to India. Hashtag no regrets. Ugh. Holy crow. Then why do we learn about this guy in school? Oh, great question. For centuries, Columbus was a historical footnote. But that changed in 1828, when Washington Irving, the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and other tall tales, wrote the first English-language biography of Columbus. Columbus was a murderous failure? That ain't gonna sell copies. Let's say he was a brave genius who proved the Earth was round and discovered America. Hmm, seems believable. Historically, gun control has been used to control and criminalize people of color. In the early years of our country, many colonies and states had laws barring Native Americans and free black people from buying or owning guns. What? But, but I have a receipt. And racist fears of black people have continued to inform our gun control laws. In 1960s California, the Black Panthers resisted police violence in Oakland by patrolling the city with guns. We have a right to protect our communities against police officers abusing their power. Defending yourself against a tyrannical government, I'm all about that. Well, state lawmakers responded by passing a bill that banned open carry. The bill applied to all Californians, but it was meant to blatantly target the Black Panthers. And that bill was signed by then California governor and NRA member Ronald Reagan. I'm just not comfortable with certain people carrying guns <laughs> for uh, reasons. Oh. Ava! Oh. Babe. I'm so sorry. I had no idea gun control used to be so racist. Is that what you told her? Well, I wasn't done. <laughs> so not my responsibility to teach white people their own racist ass history. All right, white Urkel. I'll take it from here. Please do, and thanks for the compliment. Sarah, even today, a lot of gun control laws really end up being about controlling black people. In the mid-2000s, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms performed 10 years of stings to combat gun crime. A full analysis found that 91% of people arrested were people of color. And we're not just talking about the red states. For years, New York City had an official policy to stop black and brown people on the street just to see if they might have guns or drugs. Stop! <laughs> Sir, you're in a public place and you look, you know, dangerous. What? Oh. Sir. Records show that these stops almost never found guns. Between 04 and 2012, 4.4 million people were stopped, but only 1.5% of them had weapons. Men in my family have gotten jaywalking tickets from the NYPD after they didn't find anything in the stop and frisk. They weren't stopping criminals, they were just stopping black people. Ava, I'm sorry, I, I had no idea. You've never talked about it. 
It's not her responsibility to talk about it. It's our responsibility as a country. This is James Foreman Jr., Pulitzer Prize winner and author of the book, Locking Up Our Own. There's a connection between the overly punitive gun sentencing laws that were passed in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, and the current crisis of mass incarceration. Instead of national gun control laws that could stop the flood of available guns, we have local laws that penalize possession, and those laws are mostly passed in cities. So the result is that guns are everywhere, violence is rampant, and the only people who go to prison for possessing guns are poor people of color in our nation's cities. Black people face the highest rates of deaths by guns. But instead of protecting the families and neighborhoods who face the most gun violence, our current gun laws just double down on destroying them. And that's why we shouldn't talk about new gun penalties without first talking about how we transform our criminal legal system. All right, Adam, I got to get to my Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I think we all learned a valuable lesson about gun control. No, Dan, that's something you need to realize, too. Gun rights don't protect black people, either. Take the Stand Your Ground law the NRA pushed legislators to pass in Florida. It says use of deadly force is justified to defend yourself in your home or car, even if you could run away. But in practice, not everyone gets to use it. Marissa Alexander was sentenced to 20 years in prison just for firing a warning shot to defend herself against her abusive husband. Stand your ground didn't help her. Or look at what happened to Philando Castillo. During a routine traffic pullover, he informed the police officer that he had his gun on him. And the cop shot and killed him in front of his girlfriend and her four-year-old daughter. But I drive with my weapon every day. That's not against the law. OK, so imagine I'm a police officer pulling you over, and you're Philando Castile. Do you have your license and insurance? Yes. Officer, I do have to tell you, I do have a firearm on me. OK, don't reach for it, then. I'm, I'm... Don't pull it out. I'm not pulling it out. He's not pulling it out. Don't pull it out. Bang! That is the exact moment Philando Castillo was shot. He did everything that responsible gun owners are supposed to do. And the NRA didn't come to his defense. For all that talk about protecting gun rights, they sure are quiet when black people are gunned down for exercising them. And we've reached the end of the video, which means you have two options. Option one, hit the subscribe and never miss another new video from Adam Ruins Everything ever again. Option two, start reading the comments and weep for humanity.